Previously on Disruptive Pitch. I'm confused really as to what you would do for me. But what we want to do is add value to what they've already got. You were told how much the barrister was charging? Yes. Did you question it? Uh, I did. Did you say, can you find someone cheaper? Uh, I didn't. We decided to actually design it for the customer. But there must be a catch. Why should there be? We've done that research in, in, in Europe, in the US, it does not exist, the way we built it. How are you going to make sure your app is visible? It's a very good question. Contestants from all over the UK have come to pitch their ideas to four of the industry's leading technology specialists. Emerging and startup technology companies have come to London for their chance to have their pitch heard. Judges Neil Catamore and Andrew McLean from Compare the Cloud will be joined by guest judges each month. But this isn't about delivering just any pitch. It's about who's got what it takes to deliver the perfect pitch. Hi and welcome to Disruptive Pitch, where 15 to 1 meets the question of sport. I'm still your host David Fern and this month we've got six brand new startups to meet our judges and see if they can make it through to our live final at Cloud Expo Europe and join SoShaw and Clark's Room Direct in the live final. So without further ado, let's get started. Hi there, how are you doing? Hi, good, thank you. Good, so what's your name, where'd you come from? My name's Paul Rawlinson, I'm from Innovate IT Limited in Ashford in Kent. Fantastic, so you ever had to come far today then? No, not at all. Good, and do you get involved in any much pitching and uh, ever done anything with, uh, with judges before? Not really, no, it's new for me, so uh, yeah, fingers crossed. Good, well they're a lovely bunch. Look, you go out there, thank you. enjoy, and uh, we'll see you back in here after us for a debrief. Well done. Thank oh, you very much. Thank you. So, let's see how he does. Hello. Uh, my name's Paul Rollington. I'm from Innovate IT Limited in Kent, UK. Um, uh, we are a cloud technology company who have developed our own hardware appliance that, uh, and software uh, layer that is used to deploy um, vanilla OpenStack services in a hyper-converged one new appliance chassis. Um, and what we found by talking to the markets uh, at an SME level is that there really was no real choice for those for those levels of business because um, <clears throat> to, in order to own traditional private cloud infrastructure in their own data centers it's very cost prohibitive they couldn't afford that um, being small businesses um, so they were basically um, forced down the public public route um, which is brilliant because very quick to start out and everything else like that. But um, uh, what they find is um, after, after their team starts to grow and, and build on their own success, um, their success becomes actually reflected in the monthly billing um, from their public cloud provider because the more developers they have, the more cloud instances they require and it, it starts to spiral out of control. Um, so what we've done with our one new appliance is we've provided a, an open source uh, developed uh, application and uh, an open source infrastructure appliance um, that has got a, a one-off fee. So it's, a, it's a, based on a CapEx model. It comes with three years support from us and three years of next business day hardware break fix. So they're covered from a support perspective. Um, but what that also allows them to do is manage their ongoing costs for at least three years. So um, they'll find that they can save at least 50% on average, um, speaking to our customers. Um, they'll save 50% on their, what would be their public cloud costs. Um. <laughs> um. um, Hyperconverged. I Maybe this is a little bit of education for me, but I always thought the point of hyperconverged was lots of servers doing the job of becoming one server, but you've got it all in one U. How, how exactly does hyperconvergence work with a single unit? Uh, well, I mean, the, time, the term hyperconvergence, people use terminology in different ways, mm. but um, uh, it really 
boils down to the hyperconvergence of compute and storage into a single unit or a single solution. And in our case, we've got that down to a one new um, server chassis sized unit. But if you needed to ramp up, could you add additional one new units? You could do, yeah. So okay. if, you, if you fill that initial appliance to capacity, you could get another one of our appliances and use our software wizard to to scale your, your cloud basically. So you'll have one logical cloud across multiple physical machines. Is the target market um, people who are going to develop their own apps or, or have you got customers installing you know, typical business application software, that kind of thing? Um, so initially we were developing the products um, mm -hmm. as it's a one new product. I mean, we've built resilience into the hardware and things, but we actually targeted DevOps. So as a uh, development and testing environment uh, platform. Um, we have ha we've actually had um, customers come to us who do want to use it for DevOps, but they also then suggest they want to um, host production mm -hmm. uh, web-based applications from the appliance as well. Um, it, it, you know, it, it's kind of the customers led us into that. Um, you know, they're in charge of their own data, so they need to ensure, obviously ensure backups are taken, but we're happy for them to do that. The performance of the machine is very capable, so um, it, it's really, there are many different choices, many different applications. Some, um, some of our contacts would like to just use it as a virtualization platform, because there's no ongoing subscription charges and things like this, so um, it's, it's, it's very versatile. If, 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 so say Neil had a company and Neil's, I mean Neil has no technical skills other than the on-off button, um, <laughs> and Neil wanted to create his own public cloud, well his little I cloud. wouldn't be calling you Andy. Well you would <laughs> Neil because you can't use a computer, but other than that, um, let's assume that Neil's a dullard, uh, is this designed for people that don't have uh, technical skills in-house as well? I mean, is it, is it that level of simplicity? That, not no technical skills, but really just you put it in, you get someone to plug it in, and then you can, you know, click a couple of buttons and it... Uh, yes, to, <coughs> an, to answer the question, yes. Um, I mean, anyone, I mean, we've got a very, it's, I think it's like a one-pager quick install guide. Yeah. Um, I think anybody could probably follow that. Mm. Um, it is that simple. Because I mean, that's one of the benefits of public cloud is that it's really easy. You just click, 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 click. If you, if you've kind of replicated um, that. Yeah, I think, uh, again, a differentiator there would be that even public cloud asks too many questions around storage yep. and things like that. Mm -hmm. We kind of take that away. We don't give the end user too many options. Some, there are some defaults that we're, you know, we're kind of making a decision for them on their behalf with the understanding that they might not even know the answer if we did ask them it anyway. So, um, yeah. One of, one of the biggest challenges for public cloud has always been resiliency uh, when you have multi-tenanted environments. And, and I'm guessing the appliances could be put in unison as a, a primary and a backup environment and you can configure them uh, for load balancing, bits like that, I guess. So, you, you can certainly set up load balancing and things yeah. like that. If you wanted to go to a more sort of enterprise level of resilience uh, and disaster recovery, for example, you could actually, uh, we, we, in our software right now, we don't have like, like self-healing and things like that built in. Mm -hmm. um, that's in the future, hopefully. Um, but what you could do is you could take an existing cloud management platform uh, some, from, a, from a third party and because we open up our appliance with the OpenStack APIs, um, and we obviously test this in-house, um, our, our appliance is um, able to interoperate with most major CMPs. So um, from within the CMP, when you, that enables the enterprise functionality that you need to then do self-healing, ensure there's uh, elasticity in your service and things like that. So thresholds can be set and the CMP will manage that, but it will communicate directly and uh, provision the, in, the services on, on our appliances. That's fantastic. It's, Andy doesn't get out of bed before 12 o'clock most days, so we don't have to rely on it too much. So fantastic. busy uh, fixing Neil's mistakes till the early hours of the morning. Oh. Paul, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank yes. you, Paul. Thank you, thank you, Tom. <coughs> okay, how do you think that went? Um, 
a bit nerve-wracking at first, but yeah, I think I settled in. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's half the fun, isn't it? You've got to sort of get into it and get into the flow of pitching. So, uh, yeah, fantastic. So, brilliant. Well, look, thank thanks you. for coming along. Thank and uh, yeah, good luck and fingers crossed we'll see you uh, in the next round. Okay, thank you very brilliant. much. Thank you. So, one down, let's get the next one in. Hello, Hi there. how, how are you? Good, thank you. Good, 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 good. So, what's your name? Where'd you come from? I'm Melissa Snover. I'm the head magician at the Magic Candy Factory, and we came from Birmingham today. Fantastic. So you are literally our first magician on the show. Well, I'd hope so. Um, there's not many of us left. No. So <laughs> do you get involved in a lot of this? Do you do pitching? Do you uh, get out in front of people? Well, we developed the world's first 3D printer for candy, so we've been really lucky. I've done a lot of interviews. We were on Good Morning America wow. and CBS and NBC, but I haven't had the opportunity to do something like this yet, so I'm really excited about it. Well, this should be an absolute breeze. Well, good luck. Thank you. We'll see you back in your office. All right. Thank thanks you so very much. So in she goes, our first magician. Let's, figure, let's hope she can cast a spell on the judges. Hello, everybody. Hi I'm just going to start this printer going, and then I'm going to tell you all about it. So just give me one moment. So while it's going, I'm going to show you my true pitching techniques. Um, right now, this is printing a little sample of vegan gummy candy. And this is the world's first 3D printer for candy. I'm Melissa Snover, I'm the head magician, the founder and developer of the whole concept. And basically, this printer is able to print anything in anyone's imagination. We actually developed the printer based on the idea that we wanted the customer to be able to create anything that they wanted and not to be judged or to have to take something that we chose that we thought that they would want. Let's see if we can just leave it there now so I can tell you more about it. I started making candy about seven years ago and I was very frustrated by the fact that we had to make hundreds of thousands of the same product over and over and over again. And I don't like the idea as an empathetic entrepreneur that the customer has to just take what they can get from the supermarket and that they don't get a lot of choices about what they get. So the Magic Candy Factory was developed in order to allow everyone to become their own creator of candy and to basically become their own Willy Wonka. Um, it took me around six months to be able to develop the concept. I launched my first prototype in August of last year. It was five times bigger than this. It was 10 times slower and it taught me a lot. <laughs> the first day that I launched it, I actually ended up having to spend the entire evening behind a laptop spot coding the candies for all of the attendees and I didn't get to speak to a single guest all night. But the one good thing that I learned was that people loved it. And so we knew that we had something cool, we just had to streamline it. So 3D printing technology, I think everybody's heard of it before. And I think everyone in the world will agree that it's cool, but it's super hard to use. And this is the major problem. When 3D printing came out of its patent protection in 2012, everybody was like, wow, this is so amazing. It's gonna change the world, oh my God. And then everyone's like, oh, what do you do with it? How do you use it? Oh my gosh, it's really hard. It is really hard. You have to know CAD design, coding principles, slicing techniques, I mean, and also material behavior. And so, so many people thought 3D printing would take the world by storm, but sadly, it didn't take the world by storm because it was far too hard to use from a technical perspective for the regular consumer. So Magic Candy Factory, it doesn't look like the ingredients are hot enough. We're going to do another one afterwards. Don't worry. I think it's because we turned it on and off, but don't worry about it. Um, basically what we developed at the Magic Candy Factory was a way for anybody to engage with 3D printing. So we have a little tablet here and in our retail format stores, the tablet sits facing the customer and they'll be able to basically draw something, make 3D shapes, write words, upload photographs and images like logos and combine any of those elements together. And then our software with three different parametric algorithms creates a 35,000 line code automatically for them that is perfectly sliced for our material. So every single time when the ingredients are hot enough, as you saw the other examples, the candy prints out perfect every time. And this is really a game changer for 3D printing. The other day I th taught a 79 year old man to use a 3D printer and a three year old child in the same day. And the only reason that was possible was because of our software. In addition to that, we have a patented recipe, which is based in apple pectin, which is vegan, vegetarian, kosher, halal, and free from all major allergens, including gluten, dairy, soy, eggs, nuts, tree nuts, cassians, and wheat. And it also was only developed for the printer. So if you think about how fast the printer is moving around and how quickly it needs to create layers in order to create meaningful shapes, our candy recipe has to dry in five seconds. Regular candy recipes dry in five days. So if I put a regular recipe in that printer, it would print a puddle of nothing. So we had to develop a patented recipe. And then the printer, the baby. 
This is actually the world's first FDA and FSA approved 3D printer for food. It's been made with all food safe um, ingredients, everything, all of the materials inside, and the whole system at which the product is delivered to the platform and the way that no one actually touches it or damages the hygiene and the integrity of the product allows us to be able to sell the product that we make at the end, which is the world first. Uh, we so far have now 100 printers in the market in 35 locations across the Middle East, China, the United States and the European Union. We have eight here in England. The closest to London is Lakeside. Um, and we are now focusing 2017 on developing our events business. I just got back from an event with Nickelodeon on Friday in LA and also working with amusements to bring Magic Candy to entertainment um, venues and outlets all over the globe in 2017. If only if it was hot enough. <laughs> so I'm going to, if it's okay with you, I'm just going to stop this print. And while you ask me questions, I'm going to do another one with a hotter syringe. So you can see it actually working, if that's okay. It, is the business profitable already? And if not, what's your projections for when it will be? It's no, it basically, we broke even um, in our first year in yeah. trading. Um, I started the company in April, 2015. 2015 was a straight up R&D year, so we didn't generate any revenue. It was all about testing and development. Um, la last year, we literally broke even. Um, and this year, we're projecting approximately 800,000 profit. And this is really very quite, uh, we grew really fast, really, really fast. To say that to launch 35 retail locations in nine months with a brand new concept, which has never been done before, it was, yeah, it was wonderful that we had so much interest, but I think now um, my new budget is all about optimization and making the concept run really smoothly and scaling it up in a controlled manner. Um, we also want to bring in some other optimizations for our manufacturing procedures, um, for some things like we do communication with our retail partners online. A very good pitch, Melissa. Very, Thank you. Very good. Um, <laughs> slightly upstaged by the machine itself. I know, who, which was in Which garners enough, all the it, attention but that's great. Um, how She's a diva. Earth, did you come up, I mean, did you just wake up one day and say, you know what, 3D candy printing, I mean, what's the story behind it's, this? <laughs> um, well, basically, I started my first candy brand, um, it was called Goody Good Stuff, and I sold that um, about 18 months ago to a large conglomerate called Cloetta. And that was a really interesting experience. I'd never sold a company to a big corporate situation. I did a beauty parade and I met lots of bigger companies that were in confectionery, one of them being Catches. And Catches are an amazing business, family owned, incredibly innovative, look after their own, very green. They basically sing my song. And although I didn't sell my previous brand to them after I'd sold, it was really great to be able to reconnect with them and we decided to get together and develop a new project together. So Catches had been working on all sorts of different things and we talked about 20, 30 different projects that we could do. But I said, you know, this customization thing, being able to customize on demand, that is like literally the ultimate for an entrepreneur. Every single product that we sell is the perfect product for the customer. That's a dream to come true, really. So when we started looking at it, we looked at, Catches also looked at so many different ways that the, you could make this work. And then we decided 3D printing was hot. Nobody had done it yet. We could be first to market if it would work. It was quite a scary, I got a target of getting a product to market when I had never used a 3D printer before in six months. So I learned everything I could. I read the whole Wooler report on 3D printing. I read every book that they sell on Amazon on 3D printing. I bought two 3D printers and took them apart joined chat rooms and asked questions to all of the open market of makers, went to every exhibition, uh, relearned G-coding, uh, learned slicing parameters, and then basically trial and error until I almost pulled all my hair out. And then I printed this, mm. was my first and successful eat print. Eat it, Anna. I will eat, this is, eat it. This is my magic frog and he <laughs> saved my life. I literally was trying for five weeks to get a candy to print. There's so many different variables. You have no idea how many things have to go right. And then this guy came out and saved my life. And I made a hundred <laughs> of them in all different colors. And then we knew that we could do it. And uh, Can I eat it? You not, can. That's not one of the first hundred you made, is it? No, it isn't. No, no. I mean, or but they do it? last a year. They last a year. They okay, do. Cool. They do last a year. Um, we, we recommend you keep them in the box with it closed. They will dry out if exposed to, to air, but it's not dangerous. It's just a little harder than a chewy candy like you would be looking for. Um, what do you think of it? I'm interested to hear what you think. 
Go on. That's actually very nice. It is really good, isn't it? So, kind of, because you mentioned about understanding what customers think of it. Obviously, if you're selling to, at the moment, you're leasing to retail outlets, they are then selling to customers. Are they getting the uptake from their customers in order to make it worthwhile? Yes, absolutely. Everybody is different, of course. But yes, we have several customers that are doing extremely well. But it's so cute, I don't want to eat it. Yeah, but you come on, you have to try <laughs> it. Come on, Andrew. You have to try I'll, I'll have it. Tell you what, I'll take a tentacle. Oh. oh. Thank you. Mm. Kind of quite hard to know where to start on that one. <laughs> right, okay, I'm going to try and print you a candy now. I think it's not dissimilar from printing of old where uh, on the consumable side, uh, they end up the consumables for printers are more valuable than the printer itself. Yeah. And then you're also painting the recipes and the way to put that content in there as well. You know, the printer is irrelevant at that stage and yeah. you're just, you've got a great business model. Thank you. Yeah. I'm really glad you like it. So Andy. Yes. What would you like to make and eat? I think your head. So, oh, oh I'm looking forward to this. this. Oh, oh wow! It's it. raspberry flavor. Please don't eat first. that. Isn't it cool? <laughs> I have a picture. So this, we just it's took a JPEG right off of the internet, put it straight into the printer, and as long as the ingredients wow. are hot enough, Bob's your uncle. That amazing. That's very good. Melissa, uh, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you, very guys. Much. It was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. Thank, thank you. you. OK. Hi, Hi, I'm done. So, well, that went well. I hope so. I've it never seemed seen, okay. I've never seen the judges speeches before, especially Andy, Yay, which was incredibly impressive. That's good. I'm glad. And uh, let's be honest, feeding them is always going to be a route to their hearts and, yeah. and hopefully to the next round of the competition. A little bit of sweet bribery. Yeah. Never hurt anybody. No, I've, amazing. <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. Thank and you. Uh, really great live demonstration. Thank you. Know, they, you. they always say you should never work with uh, dogs, animals, or animals, uh, children, and live demonstrations. That's so, right. <laughs> and you nailed it. So congratulations. Thank look, you. Thank you very much thank for your time. Thank you so much. And, it was uh, been a pleasure. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. All right. Bye. So, a spellbounding pitch from, uh, from that. Let's see what happens next. Hi, how you doing? Yeah, good, thanks. How are you? Good, 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 good. So what's your name where'd you come from? Uh, Nick and I come from Head Start. Fantastic. And you had long to come far today or? Not too bad. We're based in Liverpool Street, so. Oh, God, so literally about yeah. 30 seconds. Fantastic. Yeah. So uh, do you get involved in doing this a lot? Do you, uh, do you get out and, and get in front of things or people? Or? Sometimes, well, I get in front of people. Um, yeah. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you do much pitching? Do you do? Uh, uh, we do some stuff. Um, not so much like this. This is kind of a new thing for me, so. Cool. Well, look, I won't hold you any longer. Thanks. Get in front of those judges and uh, blow them away. Great. Thank you very awesome. much. Thanks Good a lot. Good Another one in. Let's see how he does. Um, Head Start's a platform matching students to internships and graduate opportunities. Uh, right now, students spend hours and hours and hours filling out application forms to tons and tons of different companies. Um, they either know what they want to do, uh, whereby they you know, spread their bets a little bit, um, or they don't know what they want to do, and, and they're kind of left with a question mark as to whether they should apply to maybe the city or a small business or whatever that would be. Um, it's, it's a time consuming process for them. Um, it's a process which is quite repetitive and, and, and obviously other than taking a long time, it's, it's also quite difficult for students to manifest themselves in, in, as themselves really on an application form which is quite rigid. Um, on, a, on the flip side to that, companies um, get thousands of applications if you're a large corporation or you struggle to find talent if you're a, a small business. Um, what we've built is a system whereby um, students can build a profile in, in about 20 minutes um, that represents themselves on our mobile app. Um, it has everything from personality traits to interests to skills to normal CV data and demographic information. Um, students will build that up, they can build it up in one go or over time and they can use that profile to apply as themselves to um, whatever opportunities they would like to through our platform. Um, on the flip side to that, um, from a company's perspective, you're, you've got a dashboard um, and what our system does is it um, ranks um, and matches uh, students that would be suitable for different opportunities at companies. So let's say I'm a company, I would post a job role um, or multiple job roles and I'd say I'm looking for uh, these types of people and what our algorithms do, they predict and contextualise how suitable um, students will be for these opportunities, thus ranking them by order of percentage match. So obviously the benefits to students are that they don't have to fill out lots and lots of different application forms. Um, as well, um, for people that don't know what they want to do, our system is able to recommend jobs that would be well suited for them um, based on the, the things that they input into our system. Um, and from a company's point of view, uh, rather than spending you know, hours and hours and hours screening um, candidates using quite basic criteria such as you know, education, limited amounts of work experience at the early stage of the process, 
we allow them to go far deeper into you know, what students are like, um, how well suited they would be for the opportunities at hand, based on, uh, I guess, if you look at it as a cultural fit versus skills required for the, the job role at hand. Um, other benefits to companies, obviously, that if they're um, thinking about it from a kind of future potential point of view, the better suited candidates to come in, the less likely candidates are to leave, um, and obviously the less candidates leave, the better and more cost efficient that is for you as a company. One of the big things we're trying to do at the moment is really broaden the um, kind of range of candidates that are able to get into a recruitment process rather than just um, relying on things like university, um, which is obviously quite exclusionary for many people. Um, we're really trying to allow a broader range of candidates into the funnel so they get the chance to shine to employers. Uh, we're working with a number of large corporations, um, some, some large you know, banks and, and, and um, other companies in the city, um, as well as a number of companies, some telecoms companies and some other types of companies um, outside of that area, as well as loads of startups. Um, and the whole point is that students have a range of opportunities to look for, um, and they can really try and find their path at an earlier point in the, in the kind of university or post-university um, process. So yeah, that's kind of what we do. Um, yeah, thanks Nick, really good pitch and very clear. Um, I guess though, as an employer, why don't I want someone who's put the effort in to research my company and find out about it and is actually really keen to work for me, rather yeah, than has just kind of clicked a button going, I'll oh, find me anything that might be about right. <laughs> yeah, no, no, completely. And I think um, that's something that we face quite a lot with employers. And um, we're not saying that we are replacing a whole recruitment process. Um, we are the earliest point in the process. We're supposed to sit, I guess, pre what a recruiter would look for in terms of an interview or why you want to work there. So the way our system works is pretty flexible, it can pass off to anything, it can integrate with existing company systems, it can pass off to psychometric tests or video interviewing platforms, it can also auto-generate auto messages to candidates saying you know, please fill out um, this very short questionnaire as to why you'd like to work for X company or whatever that would, would be. The whole point is that students can represent themselves best through this profile um, rather than um, having to write an anticipation of what a company is looking for, um, thereby sometimes you know, finding themselves trying to play to what they think a recruiter is looking for rather than just being themselves. I will say, I, it seems to me like, it's, is this going to be uh, like a social media platform, but like a, a LinkedIn for students? Is this what you're trying to aspire to do? Or, yeah, or I guess or? so. I mean, partly in the sense that um, I, I like the fact that you know, with LinkedIn you can build a digital kind of profile or what we're calling a fingerprint, uh, which is supposed to represent you. And one of the things that we found with LinkedIn is obviously if you're a student you don't have loads of work experience, so you can't really show off in the same way as some people with lots of work experience would be able to do. Uh, but yeah, I guess it is supposed to be a bit like that. Less on the social element, so we're not necessarily trying to create a social network, but more on the ability to have this digital fingerprint that we're able to put content and things through into our platform in that sense, um, but less so on the professional network, um, which isn't really necessarily what we do. But yeah, there's, there's great opportunity to really um, try and build out what we do. We're allowing LinkedIn access, um, i.e. through the LinkedIn, LinkedIn's API. Um, so we're going to allow people to auto-populate from their LinkedIn profile and, and link into Facebook and Twitter and other things as well to try and really auto-populate it as much as we can to make the candidate experience even better than it already hopefully is. Because your data mining, in essence, aren't you really? You're manipulating that data and presenting it in a way that, that I, I, as a candidate, I would like to perceive my, myself to be perceived yeah, yeah. and also people who are uh, looking for that type of candidate. And you know, Are you worried though really that there's a lot of companies doing like data mining and presenting that data in a specific way? Yeah, kind now? of, I mean, not so much worried. I mean, we, we work in quite a unique way in the grad space. Uh, there's tons and tons of grad recruitment platforms, right? There's, there's apps, there's websites, etc. But we, I guess, see ourselves as a tech company in the sense that almost all of our team are, are, are developers um, and all of the work we do is around making our algorithms as, as effective as possible, um, looking at how we can start to use machine learning around um, positive and negative feedback loops from companies based on whether they hire someone, interview them, reject them, assess them, whatever they would do. Um, so we're really trying to utilise that data in a very targeted way for um, recruiters to get the maximum benefit they possibly can and present it to them in a way that is really visual and very very easy for them to relate to because you know there's no good giving someone a system they can't use and we so I guess what we're working on is how we can make it as user friendly as possible while still being able to add a very very deep le level of I guess technology behind it. Nick, I've, I've worked in this, the academic space for, for several years before going into business um, so I I see the problem. I see a problem with universities. Um, universities promise the students the world. They go in. Depending on the university, 
the, the recruitment process for getting people jobs can be quite inflexible. Um, and there are a lot of employers looking for people that are interested in internships. So I get, I get what you're doing here. What about the universities? I mean, have you, have you approached the universities? Do you work with any universities? So initially we decided uh, that we would go um, kind of on the ground. So we, mm. we, we, had a, we have a massive ambassador network. Uh, we've got a big affiliate program with student societies. Now we've started to look at how we can work with uh, career services. We understand that a career service can't promote every product under the sun, otherwise they dilute their value as a career service. So we realised that we needed to find a way to add value to career services and we're, I can't really go into much detail on it, but we're about to start piloting with a number of universities, a means through which the careers advisors can access the profiles of students who give their consent for their careers advisors to access it, look at our job recommendations, look at where students have applied, look at the types of roles they can they could apply for and, and really enhance the role of careers advisors in um, educating and advising their students. But from a business model perspective, I'm assuming you sell to the employees. We, we, we sell, sell to large employers, so yeah. we, we're really trying to democratise recruitment, so we're trying to allow small businesses to compete for talent, so um, we, we allow small businesses to post a role for free, um, so that you know, we, we can give opportunities to people like ourselves. When we were trying to hire initially, it's pretty difficult. Um, obviously, students aren't paying anything to us, and nor would I ever want that to be the case. I, I started this business very much from a student's perspective, bought on my co-founder, and we've really developed it together. But I, yeah, 22, um, you know, spending my time trying to help students rather than applying for jobs. Maybe I should have done the other thing, I'm not sure. But, um, but yeah, no, that's, um, we, we really, our business model really is very much large corporations paying us a subscription, so trying to move away from the upon hire fee towards a software as a service subscription, um, a licensing fee for, for utilising our system, whether you hire however many people you hire. Nick, thank you very much. Yeah, great thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So, how'd that go? Yeah, it's okay, it's good. Yeah? Um, yeah, I, I think it was really good. Well, it certainly sounded pretty convincing, so uh, yeah, I think they were quite impressed, so fingers crossed. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see good, we well, look, good luck for the next round yeah, of competition. thank you very much. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. We'll, uh, we'll see you soon. Go from there. Thank you very Cheers. much. Cheers. Thanks a lot. So another one down. Let's get another one in. Hi, how are you doing? Hi, nice to meet you. Nice I'm to meet you too. How are you doing? Very well. I'm Norley Knotson. And where are you from? I'm from Laredo, Texas, but I'm based wow. here in London. I know, <laughs> far away from home. I was going to say, normally you ask if you had far to come, but I won't ask you that question because it's pretty <laughs> stupid. Um, so you're based in London? Yes, I am. Fantastic. So uh, do you get in front of many judges? Do you, do you do anything like this? Do you do pitching? I'm... This is the first pitch I do, so I'm looking forward to Fantastic. it. Fantastic. So are you a little bit of nerves or are you excited? I'm excited. Good. Well, look, I won't hold you any longer. Okay. Get in front of those judges, wow them, and we'll see you back in here afterwards for a bit of a debrief. Sounds wonderful. Thank, Thank you very much. Good luck. Thank you. So off she goes. Let's see how she does. Hi. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you so much. My name is Norley Knotson and I'm the CEO and founder of V Loco, which is literally translated as Crazy Life. It's a new lifestyle app to bring people together based on shared passions in life. Think of it as a way to find your tribe, your virtual tribe. So whether you're looking for somebody who has similar sports passions or music or art, culture, film, books, games, travel, food, wine, even spirituality or languages spoken, you can meet them all on Viloco. So the idea initially came to me about two years ago when I found myself single here in London and I was going to play golf alone, I was going to shoot with the driving range alone and I thought, okay, there's a supply and demand problem here. Being a student of economics from Harvard, I thought, okay, there's an opportunity here as well. So I thought I could build a platform and use technology in a positive way to bring people together to meet like-minded people and go offline and do the things they love. And it was natural for me when I thought of going on this adventure to ask my dearest partner in crime, Fiona de Vos von Steinweg, to join me in doing Viloco together. We'd met in Luxembourg and originally, neither she nor I knew anybody in Luxembourg. And naturally we bonded over our love for skiing, our love for travel, our love for cooking. So what we first did was we built a prototype. Then I took that prototype, I went out, I met Yario Vaskainen. He's a big, fin um, sorry, a big investor in gaming. And he loved the fact that we were trying to disrupt social and look at the two billion people on social networks, 100 million people on dating apps, and sort of blur the lines in terms of how people meet new people. So we raised money from him, we built Viloco, we're live on iOS and Android, and you may be wondering what is different and unique about what we do. Well, firstly, you set up your profile, and within preferences, you can specifically search for jazz. 
Say you love jazz, you will see everybody who loves jazz. You'll see their profiles, photos, a video. You'll see all the mutual passions you have in common with them. You'll also see a simple bio where they're from, what they do, how they describe themselves. And you'll also have the ability to start a chat. And it's very natural to start a chat when you already have something in common. And within our chatting functionality, you can send gifts and experiences, which is very unique. So I sent Fiona, for example, for the holidays. I sent her a wine tasting. I can send a cooking class, a golfing day, a shooting day through the app. As well, you can send photos within the app, just like on WhatsApp. And you can also live stream, because if you think about it, time is your most precious commodity. So why are you gonna waste time meeting somebody if you don't feel comfortable when you chat with them you know, live or know that they are actually you know, the person that they put the photos up to be? The other thing that's unique about the app, for example, I've got over a thousand matches. How do I make sense of those matches? So if I'm going to Paris and I want local content on restaurants to go to or any exhibits, I can search Paris, I can see my matches from Paris and I can ask them for tips. I can also search via tennis. So this weekend I can find a doubles partner so you can really make sense of the people you've matched with. We also got a social feed where you can post what you're doing, what's happening. So we're very excited about where we are. We're very new and we're in the process of getting the word out there. We're building our metrics in terms of what it costs to acquire users, what are the right marketing channels for us. We think it's social influencers, but we're super excited because we can monetize this app in many different ways as well. When we get a critical mass, obviously advertising, we've got very rich content on how people spend their time. We've got over 300 passions within the app. As well, we're currently monetizing the app through the commissions from the gifting and through the in-app purchases. But really, our long-term ambition is to become the LinkedIn for what you love to do in your free time. So please, you know, download Viloco and I'd love to match with you and, <laughs> and share some passions. So uh, just through my mind, yes, is it a dating app or is it a social platform? No, it's a social platform. So you can put in the app, if you're looking to meet friends, if you're looking for romance, if you're looking for movers and shakers, which was our playful way of saying you're looking to business network, <laughs> yeah. or it, why choose? Because maybe you're looking for all the above. So it's like real life. I don't know anything about you guys, you know, outside of you know the profiles I've been given on business, but you know, I'm not gonna start saying, oh, you know, I'm single, I'm looking for a date, or oh, you naturally meet people and build relationships off of the things that you love. My first job when I got hired, it wasn't because I was, you know, necessarily clever, it was because I like to shoot. I was raised in Texas and the partner at the firm loved to shoot. I knew he hired me because of that. We connected. So I think life is a lot like that. You immediately connect and feel comfortable with somebody when you have common ground. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. It was, it was a good pitch, so thank you. But I guess it feels like quite a crowded space. And obviously there is the dating side, there is the social side. So. Who do you see as your real main competitors and how are you going to make sure that you are the one that gets the, the kind of bulk numbers in order to be right. able to succeed? I mean, I, th I think what you say is, you know, common feedback that I get from people. They think it's a crowded space, but um, there's only, if you look at the dating side, for example, there's only 100 million people on dating apps. You've got 300 million single people between the US and Europe alone. So we're still only at the beginning of how people are using technology to meet other people. So from the dating side, I think that's still early days. From the social networks, obviously there are two billion people on social networks, but my life is not limited to the friends I already have on Facebook. Like there's seven and a half billion people on this planet. How do I connect with somebody if I've got some obscure passion? Like I'm crazy about bridge. You know, most of my friends don't play bridge. So how do I meet people who play bridge if I'm not part of a bridge club and I'm new to a city? It's an easy way to do it. So I think it's a space that nobody's playing in. You look at LinkedIn. LinkedIn started you know, back in 2003, you know, connecting people professionally. You could have said, oh, there's already lots of networks to do that. But no, they didn't care. You've now got half a billion people on LinkedIn connecting over business. I think the most natural thing to connect over is the things you love in life because we are all social beings. And ultimately, we work to go out and live life and enjoy it. So that's what we're focusing on and nobody's doing it. Nobody has the e-commerce platform. They don't have the live streaming within the app. And we were quite excited because we were spoken about in the press compared to a business in China called Momo that also has video. And they're like, this, these are the only guys in the West that have video. And Momo's listed on NASDAQ at four and a half billion. So we just think it's early days in what's happening. Really early days. I, um, many years ago now, yes. uh, pre-app days, I set up a a website and the idea was to, to for people to meet on based on um, interests it was within London right uh, not 
quite what you were doing, but it was of a sim similar vein. Now, I had two issues with this. Number one, uh, people treat it like a dating app, which was problematic because I was obviously trying to say, well, it's about the social, not the date right. thing. Um, and secondly, the amount of momentum that was needed to just, because everybody was saying, oh, we, we're this, we're this, we're this. I mean, how, so there's two questions. How are you going to stop it from becoming kind of slee central? Maybe that's a good way of putting it, having people like, I won't say Neil, but uh, just <laughs> constantly hitting on people, maybe. Um, and how are you going to keep that momentum up to kind of, you know, stand out? I mean, what kind of momentum have you already had? I think those are very good issues that you raise. And it all comes back to what your messaging is. So say a lot of these dating apps that exist, it's one click you're in with Facebook and that's it. There's no filter. So there's no investment. So you get everybody on there. With ours, you have, it takes two minutes to fill out your profile. So immediately you sort of get positive selection. The people that are lazy just there for like, easy come, easy go, I think we're not gonna be as interested. You know, secondly, because it's been organic amongst our friends in London, I've got friends who are married, their husbands travel, or their husbands don't do the things that they do, they don't like going to the galleries, you know, they don't play tennis, so for them, it's been purely social, they tell their friends, and you're very clear about what you're looking for. I mean, I'll be honest, like today I had to block a user because mm -hmm. he, you know, he sent me some like lewd remark and I said, I'm sorry, I'm not here for that, and I just blocked him. Okay. You know, so, it's like real life, I'm sorry, I can go to a bar and somebody approaches you in an inappropriate way, what do you do? You just tell them, sorry, not up for it. That's great, thank you very much. Sarah. Thank you, thank That's you. That's brilliant, thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, welcome back. Hi. So, how did they go? It went well, I really enjoyed speaking to the panel, they had good. very good questions. Good. It gets me even more excited about what we're doing. It's the most important thing. Look, good luck for the future, good luck thank for the you. next round of the competition, and we shall see you soon. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Bye. Brilliant. So, Successful, uh, successful pitch, and uh, let's see what happens next. Hi, how you doing? Hey, very well. Nice, nice to meet you. Good. So, what's your name? Where'd you come from? Okay, Mohammed Ibrahim from Birmingham, 24 years old, and I'm from Panesh Media. Fantastic. So, uh, what do you uh, do? You get involved in a lot of this stuff? Do you get yeah, out? Do you pitch? Much. I mean, we've had a few last week. I one tomorrow. And oh, fantastic! More to come. So, who are you pitching in front of normally? I'm guessing it's not uh, judges and a competition. Than the agencies. Fantastic. Because yeah, we obviously are currently seeking investment and we obviously work with an advertising agency, so we're looking to partner with them guys. Brilliant. Well, look, good luck. Thank you. Enjoy, so the, uh, enjoy the experience and we'll see you back in here afterwards for a degree. Pleasure. Thank you. Cheers. See you in a bit. So, in he goes. Let's see how he does. Afternoon. Hi. My name's Mohammed Ibrahim and I'm the founder and managing director of Panache. Panache is a mobile application that has the ability to potentially make any product go viral online. Now, we do this by leveraging the power of micro-influencers. So, what are micro-influencers? Micro-influencers are you, me, and the billion plus users that are currently active on social media. So what have we done? We've created a platform that provides a seamless way for brands and these micro-influencers to connect, to send out word of mouth marketing campaigns all at the same time. So how does it work? The same way you'd go on eBay to list a product to sell is exactly the same way you'd use our, use our, uh, you'd, you'd use our platform to send out a campaign. First things first, you provide the content which is either the photo or a video. Moving on, you begin to input your uh, hashtags, your, link, uh, your links, your websites, etc. After that, you move on to, sorry, the next part is saying your budget. Now, this is the good bit because we're not an agency, so we don't charge by the hour, we don't charge 100 pounds a month, and nor do we charge 10,000 pounds a year. What we do is we're open to small, medium, and large enterprises to come in and send a campaign out whenever they want for however much they want. I mean, the minimum average spend with us is about approximately 20 pounds. After that, you begin to target. You can target by age, location, gender, and interest. The same sort of way you could uh, use social, social media networks to sort of target. After that, you go ahead and you start picking your audience size. Now your audience size is the amount of followers your micro-influencers have. So we've got four brackets. One is one to 500 followers. Second is 500 to 1,000. Third is 1,000 to 1,500. And then it's 1,500 to 2,000 followers. Now these are priced accordingly, being six pound a user for the first, 10 pounds, then 15 pounds, then 20 pounds per user. Once you've picked the audience size, you move on and you'd pick your date for when you want your campaign to launch. Let's take an example of uh, you've got a £6,000 budget and you want to push out to approximately a million, uh, about half a million people. So what you'd go with first is um, your £6 bracket, which is one to 500 followers, giving your potential reach of approximately 500,000 and an estimated engagement of anything in between 50,000 and 250,000 people. Okay, so once you set your campaign date, what happens then is 
our application automatically schedules it for whenever you preset your campaign for. So for example, if your campaign is for six months ahead, okay, you could set your campaign today, influencers can join tomorrow, and six months later, the smart application will automatically schedule it to go live all at the same time, ultimately disrupting the internet. So what you'd get from that is a thousand people pushing out the same thing at exactly the same time to half a million people and engaging with more than 250,000 people. Ladies and gentlemen, that's Panash. I accept any questions. That's interesting. So if I just get this right, mm -hmm. you have a, a platform that basically um, can target using micro influencers, mm -hmm. targeting a, a target audience that that specified by me any one time mm -hmm. to get that message out, um, whatever brand, whether if you, if I wanted to make Andrew a superstar for mm -hmm. argument's sake, literally, um, uh, you could do that. But you exactly. do that, and I, it's a bit like Google AdWords, I take it. Really. In some sense, yeah. but we're leveraging the power of the real people. So what we do is on the platform, you pick your audience. So when we say you start targeting, you're not exactly targeting the audience; you're targeting the people. So the influencers who are male or female and they age between 18 to 25, they're based in West London, okay, and they're interested in football and cars. Okay, so now your product, if it's relevant to them, so them specifics, you can set a campaign for that. And anybody that's not male can't join it. If they're not in between 18 to 25, they can't join it. If they're not from West London, they can't join it. However, on the other side, if they're from them locations, from that in that age group, interested in the same things, they can send out that campaign to their following. And why we say it's good is on the basis that it's word of mouth marketing. So if I went to my friend and said, hey, I bought an Apple iPhone 7, it's really good. I'll give them my review on this. Are you with me? So what we're doing is making the recommendation, the word of mouth marketing, built in, built in with technology to spread out to a million people all at the same time, or more. How do those influencers join a campaign? Uh, they visit the same way you'd use Groupon to see which ones you know, group on the application or the website, the same way you'd go on whichever gift you want to send or buy. It's exactly the same way they pick which campaign they want to work on. So they're live on our platform. You can scroll through whatever sort of fits their criteria. They can click and can join the campaign. Obviously, um, on the basis that they match in terms of their following size, their gender, age, location. It's an interesting market. The problem with, the problem with this market's always been that there's so much, so many companies that promise viral things and most of them, it's, it's, just, it's just a nonsense. Um, so you go onto Apple and you, you go on the iStore and you say uh, Twitter influence and there's lots and lots and lots of little apps that allow you to, to do that but really it's either a manipulation of the users that are on it who are trying to get credit themselves or it's uh, fake users and things like that. How on earth are you going to differentiate yourself away from the the bad apples, so to speak. See, we've got security features built in already. So any influencer that joins our, uh, joins our application, they can't sign up without providing their sort of government ID, driving license, passport, etc. They, they, they can sign up and they're on the app, but the moment they press join campaign, because they're suddenly excited, they can't move forward unless they provide their sort of um, passport or driving license, which will authenticate them with us. That will provide that they are real. Then we've got a built-in analytics feature, which will obviously grasp the engagement levels, the following levels. And what the brand gets on the other side is when they get, for instance, a thousand people to join, they can look through every single influencer. Oh, I don't like this, I don't like that. The engagement's too low here. Uh, these guys, you know, there's been a gimmick in on, um, so there's been a bit of a bug on, on the app. This guy's suddenly not from West London. It literally says Birmingham there, so they can remove these people. So in terms of um, keeping away bots, we can do that because bots can't have passports and driving license. But um, what we say is because we can engage with such a big following and how we can engage with so many people, it's all there itself. The analytics feature will give you that this person's got 500 followers to getting uh, likes and shares in between 100 to 400. But you've got a margin of there of between 10%, 90% in terms of engagement before they've joined your campaign. So if you don't like it for whatever reason, you can just press delete. And that's great, and I, I get that, but what about pitching this to the, the big bad world? Uh, how? How are you going to get around the problem of people perceiving these types of services as, you know, branding them in the same place as the fast followers type thing? I mean, how have you? The thing is, um, in terms of what we do, it's com it doesn't really, the platform that we've got doesn't exactly exist at the moment. It's, there's no actual platform that you can go on and you can get 100 people to say, do what you want them to do or post what you want them to do, for instance. There's nothing that exists like that. There are some that will give you fake followers, etc. But that's nothing to do with us. We don't give you followers. We don't promise you anything. We promise you like, shares and comments because brands want to pay for engagement. They don't want to pay for reach because everybody promises you reach, but potential reach. What we do is we can guarantee you, you look at this account, at, on average, they, they're bringing in, in between 10 to 50% engagement in comparison to their following. We're saying to you, you, they'll post something similar to yours, for instance, a Coke, let's say they've got a new product out, they can endorse it with themselves, 
keeping it relevant to their following, posting their there and they're saying, hey guys, I've just tried this, it's amazing, it works. They get the 400 likes, the 400 likes can easily sort of accumulate into, I don't know, 10 customers. These things obviously we have to calculate after with enough to the brand, but we've left it as an open platform. We're not working as an agency where we provide the content or anything else. What we're doing is giving them the portal to work alongside billions of these users. Okay, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank, you very much. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Cheers. I'd just like to go through. Cheers. Thank you. So, hey, how did that go? It went well. I mean, uh, the nerves got to me a bit. They were just looking at me, but I mean, it happens. I mean, yeah. we're still picking up the pitching, so. Well, yeah, I mean, and the more you do, yeah, the easier it's going to get. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. No, don't be silly. You're absolutely welcome. And yeah, Pleasure. good luck in the next Thanks round. And uh, fingers crossed, we'll see you back here Thank uh, you. another day. Appreciate it. Brilliant. All Thank you very much. Cheers. Cheers. So, another one down. Let's get one more in. Hi, how are you doing? Hello, I'm fine. Nice thanks. to meet you. Nice to meet you. So what's your name and where are you from? Olga, I'm from Russia. Fantastic. Based in London at the moment. Oh, oh well, fantastic. I was going to say, can we have a, for this from Russia? It could have been a little bit extreme, but uh, <laughs> yeah. good, fantastic. So uh, do you get involved with much pitching? Do you get out in front of people and talk? and? Yeah, I quite like that and I, I engage in pitching um, a lot, specifically for the investors. Yeah. But this is a new and exciting opportunity for me. I was going to say, doing it in front of a panel of judges who were uh, looking at your pitch is very yeah. different. Yes, it is, it is. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, look, good luck. Thank Enjoy you. it. And Thanks. we'll see you back in here afterwards for a bit of a debrief. Thanks. No see problem you. at all. Here we go. So, another one goes in. Let's see how she does. Hello, uh, my name is Olga, I'm a co-founder and CEO of Lobster and we are changing the way people license photo and video content. I've got brand marketing experience myself and I know how creatives struggle with stock photography. At the same time, 2 billion photos and videos are posted every day on social media by real people like you and I. But we can't use them because it is illegal. To solve this, we have created Lobster. With Lobster, anyone on Instagram, Facebook, Flickr, YouTube, Vimeo and other platforms, nine in total, can just sign in once with their account and then we index their content and make it licensable for the creative professionals in the industry. We capture hashtags, geolocations, dates, resolutions, everything. What's most exciting, we then add AI image recognition to tag those photos and videos automatically and then to see if there are faces, if there is a um, specific age and gender profile in the images, something very, very interesting for the creative professionals working on visuals. So creative professionals just buy a subscription uh, for 50 to 50 or 1,000 pounds per month to get full access to the tech and a package of credits to download images and videos from real people. And then uh, people get 75% of all the revenues coming for their photos and videos. And the professionals get exactly what they need, a proper royalty-free license, same as they would get in stock photography. So we recently call it Uber for stock photo industry because we connect creatives with real people um, and we have first paying customers um, for our product which are mainly advertising agencies and some very cool consumer brands media and blogs um, and we actually right now are targeting to raise awareness of the product to make more people uh, learn about the possibility to license photo and video content legally from real people and to find it with our image recognition system. Um, so we invite the judges uh, to bring their creative colleagues, um, but we also in invite everyone in the general public to join the platform and help us change the world of the visual content. And remember, the world is your lobster. Thank you. Um, Olga, I like it. Uh, I, I think the world is changing with the, the fact of the technology moves mm. on with infrastructure uh, like blockchain, cataloging, yes. uh, digital media is mm. this prime example of that. My, my only concern with cataloging and, and uh, digital media, and certainly if it's from a personal point of view, mm. using it for commercial value, are you ever worried? How can you? How do you police it? Because you know there could be some really sensitive photos all over the place that, that you, your system could suck up, and yeah. and it'll be 
you know, embarrassing photos of Andy would be in the next yeah, forever give, years. I'd have to give permission first. Yeah. But, but if it's tagged. Um, if I've taken a picture of Andrew and it's yeah. under my, my name. It's a very, very good question, and it's got, in my mind, two or three parts uh, I will address. So, first of all, of course, you have to opt in and permit licensing. Then we are um, allowing you to choose either all of your photo stream or some folders. For example, you can uh, select only your travel albums on Facebook and do not give access to your family photos. And then we will synchronize, as you post new photos to this album, we will forever synchronize and do the work for you, but do not touch your family photos. Then the, the other thing is that because Instagram and Facebook, they already police uh, content for things like inappropriate content and copyright infringement, we are relying on them uh, for that thus protecting the customers on the, on the creative teams through uh, getting protected by Instagram. Then we also use image recognition for policing the content, uh, for removing inappropriate content, in removing copied content and prohibited and so on and so forth. And then finally, something also that you touched upon, um, amazing that we've developed with the face recognition. When we see faces in the image, we actually ask you uh, to ask your friend on Facebook for a permission. So then, this photo can be already used for a blog or media, but for full commercial use, we would need your friend to authorize that as well, which is in professional stock photography called a model release. Well, we just call it a permission. Okay. We use a lot of photography yeah. and we spend a lot of time trying to find stock yeah. photography. But you use the term, you would license it to creative professionals, but what about general small business owners? Yes. What, yeah, do you have a model that allows yeah. anyone who's kind of yeah. looking for stock photos? Yes. So, yes, we have... Um, on the subscription model, uh, we would say we have two segments. So the £50 subscription is suitable for small businesses, small and medium enterprises as well. And we can see some tech startups and some business owners and blog owners also subscribing uh, to that subscription, which caters to their image needs sufficiently and then the other segment would be really uh, the agency groups and the large brands like we have a Colgate Palmolive uh, group brand um, on a subscription and so on and so forth which would use the larger uh, corporate subscriptions so we totally totally invite small businesses to use this imagery and it's cool because you use imagery from real people. C copyright's a, a huge issue in well, it's not a huge issue, but it is an issue in this. Look, let me tell you a story. I, I went to London Pride one year, and I took some pictures, and they were dreadful. Mm -hmm. So I went on to Google, and I stole an image from the Huffington Post from a few years ago, and I put it on Twitter, and I said, Pride, blah, blah, blah. It's a true story. Um, a journalist from the Huffington Post contacted me and said, oh, I love that photo. Can we use this as in the Huffington Post? <laughs> now... <laughs> What's to stop, what happens in a situation like that mm. when I've basically nicked someone's photo that's already out in the public domain? Can your mm. software detect that actually I've stolen it? Because if, of course, if someone else's company mm. comes along and says, oh, well, I love that photo, I'm going to mm -hmm. use that myself and I've mm -hmm. paid you some money, how do you stop that from happening? Yeah, it's also a very good question. So, again, when legally it's uh, in our terms and conditions when you sign up you confirm that these are your images so the customer and ourselves are legally protected but of course in terms of the service uh, we are moving in that direction so we already can see similar images so we can compare now working on I identifying identical images and seeing who was the first author to post it to actually remove any infringing images? It's a very, very, very valid question. Yes. Oh, good. Didn't with blockchain you can actually do that? Yes. I'm I, surprised you've not 
I noticed that when you yeah. when you said that because um, so the big things for us in terms of tech uh, this year, of course, is search and image yeah. recognition. But we're also looking at blockchain uh, to to create digital signatures of the images one when you post it, so that to confirm the authorship, and another when you buy it to confirm you have a license. Because now we, we send it to you by email in a PDF, but it would be much more advanced. A license no one can remove. You can prove that you bought this photo and you can't give it to another person. Because a lot of similar yeah. industries are using that yes. tech to, to, to guarantee uh, authenticity. So exactly. I'm, I'm surprised that, that you're not where you will be going to that. Yes, it's a, it's a next step yeah. for us. So yeah. right now we need more people to start using it and to get aware um, and then the next step for us is exactly this. Brilliant. All good. Thanks. Thank, Thank you very you much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Hello. So, how did you feel that went? Uh, it was very nice. The judges are very nice and the questions are very interesting and very, very relevant. Good. It's a great experience. So you think they got the concept and the idea? Yes, I guess so. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, look, good luck and we really uh, hope to see you in the next round. So thank, thank you very much you. for coming on. Um, and uh, yeah. See you again. See you soon. Hopefully. Thank you very yeah. much. So that's it. Now's our judges' chance to have their deliberation and figure out exactly which two are going to go into Team Neil and Team Andy to win a chance to pitch at the live final at Cloud Expo Europe in March. So guys, where do you want to start? Mm. Well, I'll let Andrew start. What an interesting course. group we had today. Yes, very diverse. Um, we, we, we had our uh, 3D candy printing machine. We had a little bit of op open stack. We had a little bit of uh, copyright management, uh, social media app. It was a very interesting group of people. Um, and it was a tough decision, this one. It was a really, really tough decision. Um, I, I felt that I felt the three, the three, annoyingly enough, the three strongest that we had in terms of pitches was uh, the magic. In your camp. opinion, in my opinion, was the magic. Who else's opinion would it be? Would be the magic candy factory, um, Head Start app, and Lobster Media. I thought they were the three that were really came across well explained what they did and really could sh show something truly disruptive in the market. Okay. Neil? I did feel sorry for Innovate IT because they are the, probably the only in-depth technical yeah. company yeah. that was on the show. But um, However, what they did it was quite interesting. Uh, however, it's wholly reliant on an open stack going forward and it's very limited for a hardware device. But, um, the candy factory was very interesting. Never seen that before. Uh, 3D made uh, print. Uh, uh, 3D made sweets. Well, nearest, uh, nearest to the Star Trek replica we've, replicator we've got so far. Well, mm. I I ate uh, a frog, which is quite nice. Um, didn't bring any there, did you? Yeah. No, sorry. Dude. Sorry about that. And head start. Yeah, good. I like the idea of that marketing, like a, what I would describe as a a student's LinkedIn on steroids. And, well, the others, well, I, to be honest, I hate to say this, but I do agree with Andy for once. Um, and it is for once, is the fact that Lobster Media, very innovative, um, looking after you know, digital rights management, really, for digital mm. media, which is really, really good, quite yeah. interesting. And, of course, the candy factory. How can Who I couldn't love the that? candy factory, really? So they're my two, I think. Definitely uh, entertaining. So I think with the final, uh, I would imagine the order this is going to go um, would be, for me, the Magic Candy Factory. And for Neil, it's up to you. But because of the blockchain element of it, which I think could be quite interesting, lobster. I yes, sir. Yes. Fantastic. Aye. So we have a decision? Yep. Absolutely. Indeed. Brilliant. So congratulations to the Magic Candy Company and uh, Lobster Media. So uh, that brings us to the end of another Disruptive Pitch. Thank you very much for watching and we will see you next month. And uh, what left to be said is from Andy and Neil and myself. See you next month. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you.